There we are. Welcome. I'm Xavier Ducroy. And I'm Tor Norby. Uh, we work on the developer tools for Android at Google, and today we're going to show you what is new in uh, the Android tools. Uh, we actually just released yesterday night, um, around like 7 p.m., the new version of the tools and the new SDK for Android 4.2. Uh, so it's the tool uh, 21. And uh, new in 21 uh, is the EDT bundle. So this is something that we just uh, started doing is a complete package of Eclipse, uh, the EDT plugin, the SDK, and the latest platform. The goal here is that if you're a new developer and, uh, or if you're actually a, you know, already a developer but you have a new machine and you want to install a new version uh, of the SDK instead of having to download everything separately and go through a lot of documentation trying to figure out how to do everything, it's there for you. Uh, it's based on Eclipse 3.8. As soon as 4.2 is awesome, we'll move to that one. And the point is that because we install both, we don't have to tell Eclipse where SDK lives. We know where it right. is because we installed it. So right. there's Before no there configuration. Set up and now you don't have to. Do no there was configuration. A lot of set up and now you don't have to do anything. And so I'm actually going to show you that uh, when you download it, it just comes like that. You have a bundle folder, and in it you have the SDK. Uh, with, uh, if you look in the platform, you'll have just one platform. And then if you go inside Eclipse, you have, it still says Eclipse, but it has, oh, that's nope. the wrong, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying your, it is out, there we go. So that was a nice uh, splash screen, you know, it's the little things like that that are important in life. Uh, and then, you know, a nice uh, introduction, uh, it replaces the regular welcome screen for, for Eclipse. And you know you have some links you can go to do things. And but if you look at it, really, it's just Eclipse. Uh, you can once you have that one, then you can use the SDK manager to add new platforms. You can use the uh, Eclipse update sites to um, update EDT or Eclipse. So you don't have to always get the new bundle. Like when you release 22, you won't have to do that. You can just update directly from that one. Um, so I recommend you use it. You know, if you want to <coughs> install a new machine or some, or if you're just starting, just use that. It, it will really uh, help you. Um, actually, I can quit it. Yes. There we go. Um, Emulator performance. So it's something that we've, we, there isn't actually a whole lot new in 21, but in 20, uh, just the version before, we, we did a lot of improvements, so I just wanted to mention that. Uh, first, performance. Uh, we know it's a big problem for a lot of developers, so we added, uh, actually, Intel helped us to add x86 support, so they distribute the system image right now for Android uh, 4.0 and 4.1, and we're working with them to get 4.2. Um, and they worked on virtualization, so there's a small add-on that you can install on Windows or Mac, and if you use Linux, then KVM is, is part of the, uh, it's a standard um, plugin already that you can use to work with our emulator, and then you get virtualization, so the x86 system image actually works natively, and you don't have to emulate um, GP, uh, CPU with your uh, host machine, uh, and that makes things a lot faster. And on top of that, we also released host GPU, so whenever inside the Android system image running in the emulator, uh, we have some uh, hardware GL. And the new Android UI makes extensive use uh, of GL, so you, you really want to do that. Instead of relying on a um, software rendering, then we just send that to your host machine, we convert GLES to GL, and then we just render that. And it makes the emulator much faster. Uh, and then the other thing that we've been working on is hardware support. So we've had some sort of hardware support for a while now, uh, but we try to extend it as much as we can. And, and every time we do something, we try to find the, the best solution for uh, the situation. So back then, we, we added very early on telephony support where you can use DDMS to you know, send a, a fake call or a fake SMS into your emulator. And you can actually do emulator to emulator also, SMS for instance. Uh, so we use DDMS for that. Uh, we have support for camera uh, on all platforms, Mac, uh, Linux, and, uh, and Windows. Uh, in that case, we'll use the, the hardware from your computer if you have a webcam. And we introduced, uh, so just earlier this year, uh, sensors and multi-touch. And because none of the regular computers have those uh, support, really, we use uh, a tethered device. So you just use you know, your phone or your tablet. Uh, there's an application that comes with the SDK. You just compile it, put, push it on your device, then you do some port forwarding. It, it's, there's a, a little bit of setup to do, but 
Um, and then basically you can send information from your phone to the emulator and, and help it control it. Uh, and I think the multi-touch is really nice if you want to upload a, a movie of your app being used and it's using gestures. It's very nice to turn on multi-touch support because then you see these white little dots where the yes. hands are. And so you can, the user can see why your page is scrolling. It's because the finger is swiping across it. Right. So and and the goal is really like, you know, we don't expect you to have every single type of form factor. So you, we want you to use the emulator to be able to, you know, test on a, let's say, a 10 inch if you don't have one. Uh, but obviously, the emulator, you know, to support multi-touch, that's difficult. So you would use your phone. Uh, something new that we just released yesterday is UI Automator. So UI Automator is a way of a new way of doing testing. We still support, you know, instrumentation tests. Uh, nothing changed here. You can still do that. Uh, so UI Automator starts in API 16. Uh, so it's 4.1 and it's also available in 4.2. It's uh, it's only on this platform because it relies on the accessibility framework that we introduced in in 4.1. Um, it doesn't generate an APK like a, an instrumentation test you know, would do. Um, if you have an instrumentation test, you have basically two applications. You have your application to test and, and your test application. Here, uh, it's a different type of project. Uh, it's just some Java code, and, and only that. There's no Android resources. It's only code, and it generates a, a JAR file that then gets text. And then you push that to the device, and you call AM to, um, to run the, the, uh, the test. Um, we, we don't have a whole lot of support yet in the tools for it. It wasn't actually done by your team. It was done by the testing framework team inside Google <coughs> that, that work on that. Um, so we do have support to build them using Ant. So if you use the command Android create UI test project, uh, you'll be able to create an application and it, you'll have a, an Ant script that will allow you to, um, to compile and to generate the, the text file that you can then push to your device. Uh, we're working on Eclipse support. It's a little bit more complicated because when you start dealing with Eclipse, you have to create a new type of project and new launch configuration, and, and we're going to work on that. So the goal of uh, the UI Automator is, is, you know, it's more black box texting. The, the idea is that, you know, you don't really care how it's done internally. Uh, all you care about is, okay, what is the experience supposed to be? When you click on that button, what should happen? What should it launch? And you know, the, the advantage of that method is that you, you, know, you don't have to be, you could have someone else in your team do it. They don't need to know the, uh, the implementation and really they actually shouldn't care about the implementation. Uh, and the advantage compared to instrumentation testing is that that will allow you to do cross application testing. So let's imagine, for example, that your application declare that uh, yes, it can be, uh, it has that intent that where you can you know, share something with your application. So maybe you want to test that your gallery, uh, in the gallery application, when I click share, you know, I want to find my app and then I want to check that my app is properly launched and that all the information is probably there, it's the right UI and things like that. You could do that. You could basically create a test that say, hey, you know, start gallery, go to an image, go click on the uh, share button and then find my app and then click on it. And then, then you can look at what's in your app and make sure. And so to do that, you have, uh, oh, that's not too bad. Uh, you have some code like that. So if we look at it quickly, uh, get UI device dot press home, that's actually going to press the home button, right? You want to start from somewhere clean. Then we're going to find the, uh, so you have this UI selector that allows you to find some widgets in your UI. So in that case, we'll find something that it has the description app. So description is in your layout, you, if you have text object, you have a text attribute and then you have a um, content description. And that's super important for accessibility. If you have users that are blind, for example, they may you know, use their phone in a way that will give them audible feedback on when they press something. And the audible feedback will be based on content description. We actually have some, some checks in the tools to make sure that you don't forget to set those. So you'll be able to find apps and then click on it and then wait for the new window to appear. Uh, and then you'll be able to, do, uh, to find you know, uh, then after we click on the apps because you have apps and widgets. So you click on that and then you find a scroll view, you scroll it, you find inside it uh, a text, uh, an object by its text called settings and then you launch that and then you make sure and then you can do more testing. Uh, so the, of course the question is if you haven't done the app yourself is how do you know the description and all of that. So we have a tool and all of that. So we have a tool called uh, UA Automator Viewer. And so what that tool does is, there we go. So I have my phone on an app that I didn't develop. I'm going to click on that button. And then I'm going to get, there we go. So this is the Devox app, actually. And uh, 
then I can go and find whatever I want to find. So maybe I want to click on share and make sure that when I click on share and I choose Twitter, the Twitter app actually shows up or something or whatever. So actually, if I click on that one here, I can see, you know, I can see what type it is you, because you can do search by classes and things like that. You can also find here that there is a content description called ShareWiz. So I could just basically launch the, uh, the Devox app, you know, go to that particular, uh, you know, session description and then find the button that says, you know, content desk is share with and then click on that button and see what comes up and all of that. So that tool is basically like you could have a QA team that just, you know, based on UX uh, description, you know, specs coming from your UX team, they look at that and they, you know, build the, the, uh, the test and make sure that everything works. Uh, there's a lot more information online. There's because there's a, a, a new uh, API for that, right? As I, uh, API for that, right? As I showed in my slide, uh, you know, there's all that get UI device, all of that. So that's provided by another jar. Uh, and then basically your application compiled against both Android.jar, which gives you access to buttons or whatever, and then gives you also access to that new UI. Um, and so that's why we have a new way of building up. So you can use that. Uh, as I said, lots of information online. Uh, you should uh, check it out. All right, Android editing. All right, that's a very broad subject. Okay, let's see. How do I quit this? Or exit? Do the alt tab. Alt tab. Alt tab. Okay. All right. So I'm going to show a little bit of uh, the editing support. I'm going to start with XML since I know a lot of you love XML. Um, so uh, one of the basic things that you should just be aware of, it's not new. We did it about a year ago. Is a new formatter. So it does a much better job with formatting XML. So uh, if you just press Control Shift F, you get uh, a format that is much more compliant with what we show in our tutorials. So we basically like to put attributes one per line. There's also a canonical order that we like, IDs first, then layout attributes and so forth. And this one, if you try to change the order, it'll sort of put it back. Uh, and unlike most editors, this is sort of looking at what type of Android resource it's formatting. So you can see that, for example, uh, in the layout files, it'll put one attribute per line. In a string file, you know, it'll try to instead try to fit everything. And in manifest files, there's yet other heuristics which apply. There's also the quick outline, which you should be aware of. So if I, for example, am in the string file and I press Control O, this works in Java files uh, and, and now also works in XML files. So I can, for example, quickly jump to Title Explorer by just using a wildcard in this and then I can jump. Um, a very small thing we just added is the ability to have better uh, double-click behavior in these XML files. You might have been frustrated in the past if you were trying to, for example, change permission right. You would click like this and you get the whole thing. Uh, in ADT22, we'll now let you choose just a small uh, name so you can replace it. And ditto for, you know, uh, permissions and, and class names, for example. Small, but kind of useful since it's something you do all the time. Uh, let's see. We've also added support for uh, theme attributes. So you see this little uh, question mark? Does everyone know what that is? That's basically a theme reference as opposed to a normal, a normal resource reference. So now, if I go in and press Control Space, it's now actually completing based on these themes, and I can even uh, use the Control key to jump into this. So I can get, for example, into the framework resource that's defining this, uh, this uh, attribute. And uh, we also have support in XML for uh, completing custom views. So if you have a custom view, you can put XML attributes on that. Um, it's actually pretty simple. You just have a uh, style file that looks something like this. And when you're in your layout, uh, in the layout that is using it, if I now press Control Space, you'll see that it's actually showing uh, these attributes. Uh, and as of ADT21, it now works without restarting if you add new attributes as well. So if we, for example, add an attribute called DevOx, and we put some comment on it, uh, if I now switch back to my layout and uh, Control space, you can see there's our attribute. So uh, this is kind of useful if you're doing custom use because it's much easier to configure them through code, I think, from your layouts. Uh, and one thing, I, it's not really easy to show, but I just want to explain it to you. Uh, we have some users who really want to use only XML files. They don't want the graphical layout editor. They don't want the, the graphical value string file editors. What we do now is we keep track of which type of mode you most recently switched to. So if you start uh, the editor and you switch to XML and you open some other file you haven't opened before, it'll now stay in XML. And, if you, and we actually do this per type of editor. So you may, you know, I hope you prefer to use the layout editor, maybe, yes. but you don't like, let's say, the string editor, which we know is pretty weak. It's just the form editor. So you can, you know, switch in the form editor, in the, in the string editor to XML, and from now on it's going to use that unless you switch. 
Um, so, you know, it's not really a demo, but you could be aware of that, that if you prefer XML, you'll, it's not going to force you into graphical mode for every new file. Uh, one thing we're adding now for ADT22, so it didn't just ship, but that is better support for refactoring. We've had some refactoring for things like, you know, updating your manifest if you rename a class. It's been not 100% reliable. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't, like, updated everything it should be, so we're going to make that bulletproof. Uh, but more importantly, we're going to let you rename resources. So here I am in uh, an XML file. Let me just uh, change this to, a, uh, to the launcher icon, for example. If I press Control shift r which is the key binding on the Mac that you also use in Java files to rename anything, you can see it invokes refactoring. And if I want to change this to, you know, my app icon or something like that, if I preview now, you'll see that it's doing everything it needs to, which is to not only update the manifest, but to rename all the different overrides of this file, you know, including layouts and so forth. Um, there's even an R file, which it knows not to try to do because that's a derived file. So, actually, yeah, let's press OK and do that. So that's resource refactoring. We're also going to fix the other ones. And this works from uh, layouts as well. So let me just open a, a layout. Uh, in ADT21, we've added a couple of context menu items. So for example, if you pull this up, you'll see that there's an F2 action. That's always going to run the default action on that view. And I think currently that always means set the text attribute for any textual widget. So if I just select this and press F2, you know, it opens up this dialog where I can change it to changed, let's say. And here you can also, you can see, uh, there's also an action for changing the ID or rename. So this, this also has the refactoring key binding. So if I do it from here, you can see we get the refactoring again. Uh, preview is going to do the, the updates. And this also works from the property sheet now. So now in your relative layout, if you change the ID, you're not breaking all your relationships. They're all going to stick around, which is obviously what you want. Uh, we've also improved the uh, relative layout editing a bit. The, you know, uh, we showed it a year ago, and we've done a lot to it. So you know, we were showing these relationships, for example. So for example, when I'm selecting this, everything downstream is yellow. That means that there's a dependency you know, downstream from it. Uh, but now, finally, uh, in 21, it's a bit smarter about how it preserves this when you move things around. So if I take this button and I drag it down here, you can see it's moving the stuff downstream with it. So hopefully that'll be less frustrating. I know that a lot of people were pretty pissed about what happened when they tried to use it. Uh, so uh, the other thing you can notice here is that as I'm dragging things around, there's tooltips now. So it's showing me what it's about to do. So it's going to set the above attribute like this. Or, you know, if I'm dragging this, you can, you can see that it's basically telling me what it's about to do, which can be kind of useful. So uh, I'm already in the layout editor, and if you haven't used ADT20, you'll see it's quite different um, from what it used to be before. So we now have much better window docking. So let me actually unmaximize my window again. This is what Eclipse usually looks like. And uh, with Control M, you can maximize an editor. And what used to happen was you would get just a layout editor and a palette. You would lose the stuff on the right. Uh, and that's kind of hard. You want a property sheet while you're editing. So now we have this embedded window that's docked. This is a, we took this from Window Builder. Uh, and you can see I can actually iconify the palette, for example, so I get more space. And I can just hover over it to you know, get what I want out of it, and it just goes away again. Uh, and there's also, uh, on the, over on the right here, we have an outline and property sheet sort of docked together. If I were to open the property sheet, you know, it would disappear from this docking inside the outline. Uh, I think the most interesting part here is probably the, uh, the new property sheet. So let me, uh, let me actually focus on it a little bit. So let me maximize it. So here's the property sheet. You can see that if it gets really wide, it, it'll put the outline on the left and the property on the right. And one thing that's special about this is that we are not doing what pretty much every other property sheet does, which is to call the getter and get the value. Uh, so I've selected a text field, and if you know, Actually, let me, before I do that, let me show you that we have sort of categorized attributes by where they're coming from. And we also have hidden a bunch of advanced properties. So if I show the advanced properties, and they're advanced not because we thought they were advanced, more that no one's using them, so we hid them. We did some statistics on what apps are using, and those that aren't really being used, they're hidden. Uh, and so here's the attributes for a uh, from edit text. And uh, you can see here we have, if you use Android, you might recognize these little icons here. These are, the, these are the icons you get when you're doing text selection. So those are actually attributes you could set. 
And you can see we're actually rendering images in line in the property sheet. This is a tiny, tiny thumbnail, but hopefully it's useful. The other thing to notice is we're actually showing the resolved values. So for example, look at the background. This is a theme attribute. It's got a question mark in front of it. But in parentheses, we're showing what the actual resolved value is. So we're doing this because this is basically in layout library, the library that's yeah. responsible for rendering the scene. We're keeping track of who asked for what. Right, so actually that background does not exist in the XML. Uh, it's just that it happens that if you have a edit text, there's automatically a style that's applied to it. And part of those attributes in the style is the background information. So when we do the rendering, we you know, figure out what the, uh, the system is querying, and then we just record that, and we pass that back to, uh, to that. Right, so the things you've said are actually blue whereas these other things are in gray because they're just inferred. And not everything has a value, and that's because no one asked for it. So it's like, what is that thing with the, if a tree falls in the forest, does it, can anyone hear the sound? Well, no one asked but for it, so we don't know what yeah. it is, and it doesn't matter. The, the part that's important is that for the background, for example, is that you know, a, a new developer will say, hey, I want to change you know, something in my button, and I want to put a different background. And what they don't understand is that they actually replace the value, right? Because by default, you don't have the background information in your XML, so you just say, hey, I'll put a new background, or, or I actually I put an actual background. In fact, you're replacing the, old, the one, and you're changing the behavior of your, uh, of your item. Right. So the other thing that's new, um, <coughs> sorry, is the config chooser up here. This used to be two beautiful rows of combo boxes that were cropped. Um, and now, instead, we have sort of cleaned it up a bit. And you can see, for example, that the device menu here is, well, I wouldn't say it's cleaner because it's got a lot more stuff in it, but it's, I think it's much more usable. This used to only display sort of the name of the display. So we, who here knew what a WQVGA is? Right? It was a little bit tricky to know. So now, instead, we're putting the actual density, screen resolution, and screen size uh, on there so you can pick what you want. Uh, and more importantly, did, did you actually show the AVD manager? Is that is something you can talk about no, later? I didn't. Yes. I All right, so this is like a user point. time machine. Yes. Go to the end of the presentation. We're going to talk about this new AVD manager where you can create new devices. And devices you create there will actually show up here. So you no longer have to go and do this crazy UI thing. To They are actually synced now. Your AVDs. We actually just read the screen size and relevant density information, and we can use it here. So you can, you know, if you're trying to target a particular device, you can actually get the layout editor to preview that size as well. So that's the screen size. Uh, obviously, there's an orientation toggle and a theme toggle. So if I want to go and see what this looks like with hollow, I can do that, uh, just like I could in the past, just slightly more conveniently now. Uh, and the activity name is sort of, you know, uh, it's used to basically, today, we use it to figure out which theme to pick by default. Uh, but we're going to do more with the activity later. I guess we, could do, I guess we can reveal uh, the fact that, for example, we plan to do action bar rendering with it, right? So we need to know which activity is this layout associated with, because that's where the action bar comes. It's not per layout. It's an activity thing. Uh, there's the uh, locale chooser. Uh, this one, this layout doesn't have a lot of uh, languages, but I'll show another one soon. But two very important ones. Yes, two very important ones. Uh, and then, of course, there's the uh, rendering target, which is pretty useful. So you can go and uh, let's see if I pick an older theme here, uh, one that existed in version 9, like this one. Um, I can now go and switch back to, let's say, rendering target 10. And I can see what this would look like with the old uh, rendering libraries from then. This is actually running the real libraries from back then. This is not like simulation. We're pulling out the view framework classes yep. and running them. The, I guess the simulation part is the part that you wrote, which is replacing the Android graphics stack with the right. underlying So it's stack. using all of the regular view framework and all the, the rendering uh, that's done in native normally. We just put that on top of Java 2D, so it's just running inside Eclipse. But if you have a custom view, it will load it, and it will actually run your custom view in there uh, because we have the whole Android view framework. Right. This is a beautiful layout, by the way. <laughs> yes. um, so the next thing I want to show uh, is this new feature. So everything has been sort of like if you used ADT20, we didn't talk about it last year at DevOx, but you know, we showed it at Google I.O. Uh, at Google I.O., we previewed this new feature that just shipped two days ago. It was Tuesday night, not yesterday night. Yesterday night. Uh, and that's multi-config editing. And so I was pretty excited to see a screenshot in the keynote this morning. Um, but so what this feature is, is the ability to do what we just did, which is to say, hey, we can see what it looks like with this other you know, orientation or device. We can do it simultaneously. So I think the most useful one, maybe, uh, is this first option, which is the menu on the left. I can say preview representative sample. When I do that, it picked a couple of possibly important aspects of this layout. So since I'm rendering this as a Nexus 1 device, it decided to show me what it looks like on a mid-size mid screen, a 7-inch, and a large size, 10-inch. It also decided to show me what it looks like in the opposite orientation, landscape, as well as it picked another language. It picked French. Um, so just, I think it just picks randomly, but I guess, it's a good choice. I guess you like the randomness of yes, this algorithm. Yes. <laughs> um, so if I, for example, were to go and switch orientation, 
you can see that it now, the, this one switched to portrait. So when I'm adding landscape, it shows me portrait and vice versa. And if I, if I go and switch, this, switch the screen size to an XS7, for example, you can see the preview is no longer going to be 7 over here. It's going to be showing me a small size phone and a, a large one. And the key thing about this, which I guess I haven't shown yet, is that if I'm making edits to this layout, you know, it, it, I can instantly see the, what's happening. So uh, something important here is that if you have a specific layout for a different size, we're not, going, we're not showing exactly that layout in other configuration, right? Uh, that, that particular file. If you have a specific version for landscape or a specific version for extra large or something like that, we'll pick that one instead. So that if you do that change here, but then you don't see it change in another layout, then you'll realize that, oh yeah, that one is its own version, and so I need to go and edit that one too. Yeah, so I just now jump to a different file to illustrate that point, which is that here I've switched to layout that has a couple of specific overrides. And you can see there's a little file icon next to this. This, this is telling me that there's a separate layout. And I don't know if you can read on the screen. It's pretty faint. It's telling me that there's actually a file in the layout-large-v11 folder, which is going to be used on the Nexus 7, for example. So this, you can see the layout looks different. So I even if I make edits on this one, it's not going to show up over here because this is a separate file. So it's telling me this layout is essentially forked. Uh, and that's, that's kind of useful to know. Whereas here, this layout's going to be used in all these different configurations because I don't have anything else. So it's important for me to know that if I, for example, switch to the 10-inch uh, tablet, let's say I go and I do something like this. I drag it down. I have a pretty large margin like this, right? This new button is not visible on the Nexus 1, right? I have a lot of clutter in this beautiful layout, so you may not have noticed that. But the point is that this is so far down that it's actually not visible, and that's the point of this. Uh, and let, I, let me try to make the point uh, more beautifully to, with a better layout. Uh, let's see, we have... Here's the layout. Uh, actually, this is screen sizes. Let me switch to locales. So uh, let me go to a different one. Right. So here's uh, this other layout. You can see, again, being rendered different couple of different representative ways. In this menu, we have many other things we can do. So I can say, show me this in all screen sizes. And if I do that, you can see that it's actually now previewing this both on the Nexus 1 form factor, the Galaxy Nexus, Nexus 7. So I can see instantly if there's a problem, right? And again, you know, the edits are sort of kept up to date. And if I switch to locales, so uh, we have a locale menu. You can see this project has a lot more language than the earlier one, right? Uh, hopefully, you can all find one that you care about in this one. Um, on the bottom, there's a preview all locales action, uh, which is just a shortcut to the one in the config menu. There's one here as well. Um, and now you can see a, a preview rendering of this layout across a bunch of different languages. And you can see here, it just jumps out at us that in this, uh, in Greek, you can see, the look at the button, three lines. You know, in English, it was a single line, but clearly something about this translation. And I just click on it, we switch to that locale, and I can see that I probably want to work on this translation or maybe make the layout better so that these buttons, you know, they're both attached on the bottoms or something so that they don't look lopsided like this. Uh, so that's sort of a, a, a useful application for this. Uh, let's see. The other thing you can do with, uh, with these layouts is to show other variations of it. So I can switch to preview layout versions. I'm just now seeing that this layout has these other variations, actual layout files. And the, and the fourth option is to show what this layout looks like uh, included. Now, there's, finally, there's a manual mode. So I can go and say that I care a lot about a specific configuration. I care about the Nexus one. I care about it in, let's say, the hollow theme uh, with the locale Norwegian, just because. I can now go and say add as thumbnail. This is going to let me actually name this preview. I'm going to call it special. Uh, and this is the manual preview mode. And when I switch to other layouts in this project, it's going to apply the specific setting. So I can sort of create the exact configurations I care about in the, and add them all and sort of you know, maintain my own list of these previews if I'm trying to work on something specific. So we've built these automatic modes that previews like all locales, all screen sizes, tries to pick some different things than what you're, what you're seeing. But you can also pick what you care about. Like you care a lot about what this looks like in this specific locale, in this specific screen size, and you can sort of do this manually. I guess that's it for uh, configurations. Uh, how am I going to do on time? You're good. OK. Uh, I skipped right into the layout editor. Uh, another thing we've done uh, is to add new templates. So we have this template wizard, uh, Android app. So we used to have a, a new project wizard, which was, I don't know, 
10 yeah. feet tall. <laughs> it was crazy. You had to scroll in it. Yes. So we've you know, done several iterations on this to make this uh, intro flow better, and I think it's quite a bit better now. So I can create a new project, and we have a bunch of descriptions here. Uh, if you came to our talk on, on Tuesday, that was sort of an intro class, but we explained quite a bit how important it is, for example, to choose the right package name because you're stuck with it forever. Forever. Uh, and so we're making that point here. You can see five lines of description. And we're doing the same thing with min SDK, target SDK, compile with. It's very important to get these concepts right. So we're explaining them right in the wizard and also letting them let, it, let you set it there. Um, you can also create activities as part of your project uh, and launcher icons. So we have this thing called the uh, Asset Studio, which I think we did demo at DevOps last year because it arrived around September. Uh, but now it's integrated into the new project flow. So you create a new launcher icon here, or you can just stick with the default we're giving you. Uh, and then at the end, you get to populate your project with something. If you don't want to, you don't have to, uh, but most people want that. Uh, and we used to put like a hello world layout <laughs> with yes. a dumb activity in it. Now it's still kind of dumb, but better. Uh, so those templates are actually not built in. We have, uh, there's a template folder and we, we, we can add more. And we are planning on adding more. Uh, but it's also a fairly standard format that we've created. Uh, and it's based, and on, it's based on FreeMarker. So yeah. it's very like you write your actual code just like good old JSP days, right? When you're writing your actual project contents, but then you also put these little squirrely brackets, more brackets in there, and you get to write like, hey, if the main SDK is this, then do this, otherwise do this. And uh, there's already actually a few people who have uh, contributed some new templates, not to us directly, they put them on GitHub. And so you can go there, grab them, put them in the SDK, and then you'll be able to do that. I know that some of them are like templates if you want to use Action Bar Sherlock, for instance. So you could just add them and then you'll be able to use them directly and configure them because all the UI for those is completely you know, driven by the, the template. Yeah, and the developer advocates uh, on the Android team are writing many more. So this yeah. is like we're, we're planning to grow the collection of things you can add to your project. I'll probably do less samples in the future and more of these things that you insert. So you don't have to go and look at the sample and figure out what you want, copy it, rename it. You sort of get all the pieces. And I'll show you that shortly. But first I want to make the point that these templates can have lots of parameters and some of them can have different uh, version requirements. So you can see that the blank activity you can run on pretty much anything, but if you want to add like this view pager, uh, we pull in the compatibility library and right now some of this stuff requires API 11, but there's work under, underway. Has been for a while, but I yes. hope soon we'll finish soon. backport of all the stuff you need to get these templates working. So you can have sort of the, the recommended UI guidelines even working for older versions than API 11, because you know there's still quite a few uh, gingerbread devices out there, even some Froyo. All right, so I can go back. Actually, I'll just create a blank template, I think. We'll do that. And uh, as you can see, you get sort of this, actually, I'm going to switch out of preview mode now that I'm done showing it. Um, you get this uh, blank template. And the other good thing is that we're using relative layout now, not linear layout, which is sort of encouraging a bad habit. Please don't overuse linear layout. It's very easy because you, you sort of get to nest them just like the good old HTML tables, but you, you don't have beautiful alignment. You know, things across rows won't look nice, and it's also not good for performance. So we're trying to push you away from that uh, subtly. There's a very good layout you should use called grid layout, but sadly, our tool support uh, isn't very good yet. It's yet. a matter of personal embarrassment, but you know, hopefully we'll get there soon. Um, so the other thing I want to show you here on templates is that you can add stuff to it, and that's maybe the most important part. Um, so uh, we have this kind of confusing uh, name, add Android object, but I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> if there are any suggestions, would love to hear it later. But you know, you can add, well, obviously activities, and we have a direct access for activities, but this lets you add other, other stuff. Like if you want to add a custom view or you know, content provider or something like that, we have it all. I'm just going to go and add another activity. Um, and you've already seen this, some of this stuff before, but because we're no longer you know, uh, creating a project, uh, there's some additional things to, to ask you, like, do you want this to be a launcher activity? In a new project, we assume it is, but here you get to sort of choose it yourself. And you can set hierarchical parents, which is very important for the up key or the up button to work right in your app. Uh, and maybe the most important part here is that there's a next button, which shows you what it's about to do. So you can sort of sit back and decide if you like what it's doing. Uh, and you can see the important part here is that it's not just adding a new activity class, a new layout, it's actually doing other stuff like inserting things into your manifest and inserting resources into your string files and so forth. And so, you know, this, this is why I think this is much better than samples because we don't have to tell you, hey, grab this and put it there. And we the, factor half of it. And yes. Yeah. And the, the worst part about it is there are certain 
it's very easy to put things in the wrong place in the manifest. It's not free form. Sometimes people put things under the root tag when it should be under an application tag, or under, you know. So this this is going to do the right thing, hopefully. <laughs> if not, file a bug. Um, but you know, we don't actually have a bug on that. Uh, and so again, the templates you can actually go edit them. They're on disk, uh, and you know if. if we would love contributions, actually, if you're doing something good. And, it, and if they're broken, you know, please fix it. Uh, we know that there are some, you're actually going to get some lint warnings when you create some of these uh, templates. We've cleaned some of that up for 22. Um, but I guess at this point, I should talk about lint. Yes. So uh, we unveiled lint at DevOps uh, just about a year ago. So yep. This was a you know, world premiere of it. Uh, and we've been hard at work on it since. Last year, it was basically mainly for XML stuff. We would show you, it was the old layout op tool but we had you know, added some more things, like it would look at certain string problems and translations. Um, the biggest things we've added since then is support for analyzing Java source code and analyzing Java class files, and that lets us do a lot more with it. Uh, before I get into that, so let me just switch back and show you this layout. Uh, it looks like someone has a plus one by layout, right? See that little red button? That's actually not a Google Plus button. Uh, don't worry, we're not going to push it into the layout editor. Uh, it was just sort of seemed like, seemed like a useful way to notify you there's an issue here. And if I click on it, because it just says click me, doesn't it? Uh, you get to see uh, lint warnings for this specific layout. So lint, again, is a static analysis tool that looks for bugs. Uh, it can run in many modes. It can do sort of a full scale analysis of your code when you should do that, absolutely, as part of your build process. But it also can run incrementally on your Java classes, on your XML files. And in the layout editor, we run it on every edit. So if I, for example, switch to, um, no, sorry, what did, what did I call that file? Dialog? Yeah, here's an example um, you know, of, a, of a layout. So you can see that when I open this, uh, does anyone see anything wrong with this layout, by the way? Anything jump out at you? Yeah, no one wants to say anything. I see some, some nodding. Yeah, so there's a little thing here, and what is it telling me? If I hover over it, it says the OK button should be on the right. So it's basically telling me that this is sort of not idiomatic Android. In the old days, we used to have this order. That's not what we recommend anymore. Uh, but if I just drag it over, uh, you can see the lint error goes away, because now it's, now it's all happy again. Uh, so we run lint on every edit uh, for XML, and there's also ways to get rid of the errors from the UI. Uh, so let me first show you how you would run lint in general. So I can select the project like this, demo2, and there's a lint toolbar action. And here I can choose whether I want to run it on the whole project or uh, you know, um, on all projects. I'm just going to choose this project right here. And this opens a lint window, which has a lot of information for me. And now you can sort of see some of these examples of the, of the deeper Java analysis. So for example, here it's telling us there's an unexpected cast. So we have here a button that basically, you know, in, in Android, you go through this intermediate ID thing, which is just an integer. So you're basically losing type information. We don't know what a particular ID is bound to. But this is basically looking at the, uh, let's see, open declaration in Oh, don't you love these scroll bars in Mountain Lion that are coming on top of everything? Right. I don't know if I know I selected it. It's trying to do the toolbar thing. Ah. Is this going to be possible? Go away. Can I use F3? I'm not sure. Uh, F3. No. See, and this is something people have requested, and every time we give in a talk, we get the first question. Hey, why don't you make go to the declaration in Java files, not go to the R class? I wish we could. The, the problem is that you can see here that there's actually two answers that it's giving me. There's the open declaration, which is the Eclipse Java support, which says, I know this is a field, this is a field in the class, and I can take you there. And then there's the one we add, which is where it's actually found in the XML file. And unfortunately, the Java one has higher priority, and I still haven't found a way to say that ours is more important. Yeah. So anyway, hopefully, uh, I actually did file an a issue on this, and you know, uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> apparently, it's difficult. You know, to, to fix this. I would love to be able to order resolvers. You know, I think that's a fair request, but it hasn't, hasn't happened yet. Anyway, so you just have to hover, and I think probably turn off these stupid on-screen scroll bars. I try to have them on because that's the default, so I kind of want to run with what the default is, even though it drives me crazy. So yeah, um, OK, so just take my word for it. If we went to that XML file, actually, it told me what it was, didn't it? Activity demo. Active demo. OK, it's got to be the one. Button. Right, you can see this is just a button. 
right? And a button is, you can see, a toggle button is a button, but not the other way around, right? So this cast is invalid. Uh, and so this is basically cross-correlating. It's keeping track of stuff happening in the XML file. It's keeping track of what's happening in the Java file and telling you there's a problem. Uh, I guess I should try to hurry up. So um, I want to show you also the incremental analysis here. So if I, for example, do something like this, it's probably going to tell me that this is not a good idea uh, because of the new multi-user support in Android. Please don't go straight to the slash data slash data directory. You know, there's going to be like user zero and things in there. And there's actually API calls. And it's showing you which API call to make. Uh, I think my favorite lint check is the API check. So uh, if I were to do something like get action bar here, if I do this, it instantly tells me that this is basically a call that requires API 11. Right, so this is, the, this is the class file analysis thing. It, it checks at all the bytecode to make sure that any parameter, any field access, any method call, any class lookup, that they basically are, they were, they were introduced in a API level of Android that is compatible with what your minimum SDK is. So right now we're targeting min SDK 8. That's the default we set in new applications uh, because that targets 97% of, I guess, all you know, check-ins yeah. or whatever. I'm not sure exactly what the... It's devices visiting market. Yes. So anyway, uh, I, I have to either not use this or maybe use, you know, a, a action bar Sherlock or something. Right, so uh, one of the things that we recommend is that you <laughs> compile against the latest version. Uh, if you want to support, to have an application that support, you know, 5 all the way to 17 and use actually some, you know, 14, 15 uh, APIs, uh, don't use the reflection, you know, compile against 17, for instance, and then whenever you're being told, hey, what you're using is not compatible with your min SDK, then you can uh, do uh, if, you know, and then th there's an API to query the current runtime API level, and so you can make sure that you only call those when uh, your application is actually running on those version. And there's, a, there's an annotation to tell the Yes, lint, uh, I'll show that briefly. I just want to point out again, in the new dialog, we default to compiling with the highest version, the yeah. newest API. Right? This is not what everyone does. Some people like to say, if we support Froyo, we're going to compile with Froyo, so we won't ever accidentally call an API we don't have because, well, you know, Java C wouldn't find it. However, it does mean that if you want to call anything new, you would have to use reflection, and that is really error prone. That's probably worse, right? When you're doing string manipulations of method names and class names, instead, do it like this: compile with the latest API. We will. Tr Hopefully, hopefully, we'll find all of them. We added a bunch of new ones in 21, like the theme attribute I showed you earlier. We weren't catching all of those until 21. So, but with 21, I hope we are catching all of these. And so what you do is you make sure that this is only called. And when you're sure of that, only called on the suitable API, and you have a fallback if not. And when you're sure of that, let's say I know that this method is only going to be called on you know, honeycomb or higher, I can use the quick fix here. I can either suppress the warning, but better yet, I'm going to say, I know this call will only be called on Honeycomb. So I just use this quick fix. It adds this target API annotation, and the error goes away. So this is basically how you annotate. Like, if you were, work, if you were working on Action Bar Sherlock, you would annotate all the code that's doing stuff there with this, saying, I, I know this is only going to be called in a particular context. OK, I got, really got to hurry. So I'm just going to end yes. with, uh, well, definitely look through all the lint warnings. There's tons of new ones in the new version. Uh, there's a typo checker, and the typo checker uses basically um, its text files. I'm going to open one if I can. Uh, it's text files from Wikipedia. And uh, scroll bar is driving me crazy. Uh, and you can see it's just like this. This is a format that has the typo and the correct spelling. And this is much better than using a dictionary, because we're not going to have tons of false positives and things it hasn't heard about. But if, if we know that you know, people spell device with an I like this commonly, it'll, it'll highlight things that are wrong. And anyway, my plea is we don't have one for French or for Dutch. And so, you know, if anyone wants to like help contribute these, that'd be great. We have one for Norwegian, so, you know, I'm pretty happy. But it would be great to maybe, you know, unless you guys are really good spellers. Yes, uh, we are, of course. Yeah. So the last thing is, uh, I just want to, sh <laughs> uh, I didn't hear that. What? <laughs> All right. Uh, so you can run Lint. Uh, you can get an HTML report. This is a pretty good way to look at it because it basically includes the explanation. Often we can't tell you what the problem is in a single line. Often there's a whole issue to explain to you. So if you're not sure what it means, please read the explanation. And in the HTML report, we actually include you know, full details along with code snippets for you. And you should run this as part of your continuous integration. So uh, Christopher Orr has written a really good plugin for Jenkins. We're, you know, I'm a big fan of Jenkins. Uh, and basically you can, get, you can run Lint just as part of your build. In 21, we have a new target for Ant built into the, the 
files that we gave. So you just, it's very simple. You just add lint as one of the targets in your uh, build job for, for Hudson. That spits out the XML Jenkins. file. You said yeah. Jenkins. <laughs> Old habit, Jenkins. It, you, you, uh, it spits out an XML file that uh, Jenkins can read, and then this plugin will find it. Then you get you know, a lot of details on what's going on. So you can go into the report, uh, click on it. You can sort of look by type. You can focus on you know, the w things that are you know, real errors, missing prefix, that's not good. You, know, you can see here, someone tried to do color without the Android prefix, that won't work. Right, and we actually have found a lot of that in a lot of code. Uh, with that, I think I should <laughs> give yes. you back it's whatever's okay. left. We're good. We're good. Okay. Um, no. um, no. All right. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the new build system that we're working on. Uh, we've made a lot of uh, work in the past couple of years uh, improving the build system that we currently have in the SDK. Uh, we have a non-script, we have the ADT plugin. Uh, both of them do the same thing, but support implementation. Uh, you know, we've added a lot of features like supporting library, uh, supporting library is slightly better, supporting library a little bit better even, uh, but it's still not good enough. Uh, there's a lot of issues. I know that a lot of developers are hacking around the XML script, uh, the end script, and then whenever I change something, then I break them and it's like, sorry. I mean, there's no API, so it doesn't work. So we started uh, several months ago working on a new build system. It's not ready, but it's actually available to, uh, for testing, and so I'd love to get you know, feedbacks from you developers to see you know, what works for you, what doesn't work for you. So I'm just going to give you a quick introduction of all the concepts and things like that, and then you know, feel free to try it. Um, so when we designed the new build system, we had uh, several goals in mind. Um, you know, the first requirement, we know you want dependency management. That's what drives a lot of you to, to Maven. Uh, so we'll have dependency management you know, built in. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there was a lot of flexibility and extensibility in the manifest, uh, in, the manifest in the build. Uh, there's a lot of you who, uh, you know, as I said, hack around the end script, and we want to stop that. Uh, not because you know you shouldn't be doing it, but because we need to provide all the functionality that you require and correct extension point for you to actually use, do that correctly. Uh, one of them is like we know a lot of you are creating more than one version of the same app, and we want to enable that. And then finally, ID integration. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that you have one build script. Uh, whatever you describe in your build script should be used by the IE, should be used by the command line, and should be used by your continuous integration uh, server. So um, we decided to build that new build system on Gradle. Uh, so why Gradle? Um, it's very flexible and extensible. Uh, you know, dependency management is built in, but it's not just for Maven. If you are a big enterprise with IV repository, you can use that too. Uh, if you have some custom tasks because you have some specific extra step in your build that are using Ant, you can use that directly. Uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, the thing that I really like is that it's very open-minded. You can use it to do whatever you want. It doesn't force you to do one, uh, something you know, in a very specific way. Uh, but more importantly, it's not just a build system. It's a build system toolkit, and so we can really use it to create you know, an Android build system, right? It's not just, you know, in ADT we have the uh, regular Eclipse uh, builder and then we have some tasks before and some tasks after, but we can't really control the Android build, uh, the, the Java part. So here we can really control everything that we want to do and there's a tooling API for, for the integration. So, um, you know, as I said, you know, not a, just a Java build with some before and after steps. Uh, we introduced a new build concept to try to you know, uh, answer some of the uh, needs that you guys have. And uh, you know, we can support things like you know, we have dependencies that are more than just code, like jar file, right? We have resources in it that, are very sp that need some specific treatment, so you can, we can implement that. Uh, and we can create a new language for you to describe your build. And so um, one of the first thing in terms of concept that we introduced was uh, product flavor. So we know that you want to uh, create multiple versions of an app, whether it's, for example, you have a game and you have a free version and a paid version. <coughs> uh, you know, so you're going to want to have two different versions of the, the, the same application. You're going to want to have different code and resources based on you know, which version you want to build. You're going to have different dependencies. You know, the free version may have you know, some add you know, SDK, uh, SDK to be able to show add to your user on one end. The other one, maybe you'll have you know, in-app billing in it, for instance, so you want different dependencies. Uh, 
And uh, you want to be able to customize different things, right? They need to have different package names. Uh, but how do you deal with that right now when you have a single manifest, right? You can do that. So here you'll be able to do that declaratively and then customize, you know, min SDK target, target SDK version, uh, all of that. Uh, and then signing information, right? If you need to have two apps signed differently. Uh, next to that, we have something that we call build types. So build types, are, uh, it controls how your application is built. Right now in Ant or in Eclipse, you can build in debug or release, but there is very little difference between the two. They are signing and uh, whether we insert in the manifest the fact that your app is debuggable. Uh, so here we just extend that, right? We, a lot of you are asking, you know, I have map view and so I have an API key. It's different in release versus debug because it's tied to the sign. Uh, the signature, how do I do that? Well, here you'll be able to say, you should have some resources that are separate for debug versus release. And so you'll be able to customize some of the parameter, have different dependencies, or even like a manifest, right? Uh, maybe your debug application wants to access the internet to log some information, you know, whenever there's a crash or something like that, but not the release version because you don't want the app to actually have that permission that you, the user wouldn't want. So here you could do that. You could say, hey, for my debug, I have the... Uh, the, the internet permissions. And by default, you, you have those two different uh, build types, but you can create new ones, right? So let's say you have, you use ProGuard extensively, you know, obfuscation, optimization, everything like that, and you have some issue that you can't really debug because it's obfuscated. Well, you could create a new type that, you know, almost release, that is exactly the same as release, except that you don't do the obfuscation and you try to see maybe if that helps you. Um, you could really create as many as you want. You could create one that's specific to accessing your test server versus your production server while the regular debug accept, access just like local data, you know, depending on what you want to do. And those two concepts are very different. So what you end up with is build variants. If you want to build an app, you're both going to generate something based on the flavor and the build type. So here, if you have free debug and uh, free paid and debug release, you'll actually have four different APK. And we have some rules to deal with resources, you know, which resource is actually used. Um, and then, uh, Google Play Store supports multiple APK. You can have like two APK based on different things. For example, uh, you have a game, you want x86 versus ARM code, and you want two APK that are exactly the same except for that particular uh, packaging. So, or, and there's other type of, of, uh, of split. And so here you have the ability to say, well, I have two groups of flavor, free versus paid, and they each have their own code and resources. And then I have two, uh, a group that's ARM versus x86, mostly driven by packaging rules. And then we just basically do a matrix of all of that and we generate all of those uh, APK for you. Now, of course, you're going to think, well, it becomes, well, how do I deal with all those APKs, right? Um, so first, you know, we, we really will generate all of those for you. Uh, we allow you to test them separately. So if you want to test something, you know, you're going to have the generic source code for all of the tests and then you're going to have the ability to have code to test very specifically so that if you want to have code specific to test the app version or the paid version of the free version, you can do that. Um, so, as I said, it's available right now for testing. Uh, you know, this is how to use it. Uh, you need Gradle 1.2, and then we have the plugin. It's actually in Maven, uh, so you can apply it. So I'm just going to go very quickly through some of the examples on how to define your build. Uh, this is a very basic project. You have, you know, the target that replaces whatever was in project of properties. Uh, and then you have default config, which is actually not necessary, but you can override manifest information here, you know, package name. Um, version code, mini SDK version, things like that. The interesting thing here is that you could have some groovy code that, you know, dynamically generate the version code based on maybe the day, you know, if you want to increase that, increase that, you know, have incremental build, uh, you know, so you could just assign that here. Um, so that's one. And then the other one is, you know, if you want product flavor. So here under free and under paid, we are just overriding. So default config declare version code, mini SDK version, and then the free extends one of them and then paid extend the other one. Uh, so we have this rule of which version extend which version. Uh, something important, you see those two applications have different package name, but the R class is always generated based on the package name declared in your manifest so that you don't have to deal with import. Uh, I've told with, talked with developers who are telling me, yeah, I'm exporting a different version of my app that has a different package. I have to like, change the package that generates a different R class. I have to refactor all my code. You know, it just doesn't work. So here, that has no impact on the R class. It's only once we package the application at the end. So all your imports are always the same no matter what the uh, package is. And then uh, build types, uh, package name suffix that allows you to create a, a custom package just for debug so that you can install both of them uh, at the same time and then you can create a new one. Uh, in terms of task, 
you know, we generate a lot. Gradle just allows us to dynamically generate every task that you want. So Assemble will build everything. Assemble 3 debug will build just 3 debug. But then Assemble debug will build all flavors that are debug, for instance. So you can really control that and then test. And then uh, finally, something that we're going to introduce in the next beta version, uh, the ability to customize here. So here, you know, after I do all my build, declare my, my flavors, my uh, build types, I can easily, you know, loop on all the variants that have been created based on all of those flavors and all of those things, and then go, and so here I'm just creating a new task, I'm adding some dependency between the existing task and my task, and then just rewiring the input and output of all those different tasks to basically insert something into, uh, in the middle of the build. Um, this is the roadmap, we're running out of time, so I'm going quick. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to work on better testing support, lean program integration, and there's a lot of missing features that we need to just simply add. Uh, but we focused on the, on the concept uh, at the beginning. Uh, and this is us. Uh, we work directly in the open, in the Android open source project. Uh, if you want more information specifically about the tool, like 21, we released like previews of 21 for like two months before we released it. So as we worked on the next version, you know, we'll add new, uh, new previews of the next version. So uh, feel free to, to try them. And then if you want to talk to us, edit Dev. And with that, questions. Two, two questions. Can you come up to the microphone? Yes. We're looking for very good questions. Yeah. Please go yes. to the microphone. We have one on the way. We have time for one more if someone wants to queue up behind him. Only one question, all right. So since you're integrated with Eclipse, uh, do the Jenkins plugins also work in Hudson, since there's also an Eclipse project named Hudson? Uh, I don't actually know. Uh, I mean, I, could, I, mean I, I think that the source code is open, so uh, if there's porting work to be done, I guess, um, you know, I, we, we just yeah. haven't heard any reports of it, so yeah. uh, it might work, we just don't know. All right, second question. Someone else? It's a good one? Okay, fine. Really, no one else? Okay, go ahead, Jack. Uh, the UI automator stuff? Yes. The, the code that's running the actual test uh, has English strings? Yes, the UI automator on the strings. Uh, I actually don't know. So the question is about the fact that uh, when we look for resources, uh, we, we actually look for strings that are hard-coded, and I actually don't know what the uh, testing, is, is the, uh, testing team is planning to do for that. Um, but it's, I, I, I think they're aware of it, but I don't know exactly what they're planning to do. All right, anyone else? Yes. Lots of images and lots of resolution to deal with that. Yeah, uh, we are aware of that. Uh, something like the uh, Asset Studio would help you, depending on what you want to do. Uh, were you There's doing just uh, like nine patch or just general images? Yeah, nine patches. Uh, I think it's definitely something that we want to improve. There is a nine patch editor right now. And it's kind of like on a roadmap of trying to figure out if we can do something where you, you input all of your regular, uh, uh, all the densities and then you, you, know, you have the ability to uh, set your zone in one and try to just scale them to all of the other ones to help. Um, but We're out we, of time. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.